This major economy is crashing. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, it's far worse than I thought, and this surprising move proves it. Now, if you're wondering what we're doing in front of the People's Bank of China today, when you see what they just did, it tells us that what's going on in China's real economy is far worse than what the data suggests. Plus, we have a sponsor of today's show who builds flexible data centers to buy and use all of your excess energy in what is one of the most unique business models that I've ever seen. And if you like trading moving averages, we're going to make the case of why their stock could go up as much as 52%. Stay tuned to the end of the show or check out the description or pinned comment for more information. Now, I want to start today's show out. We're going to look at the U.S. data that we just got today. We're going to get into what's going on in China, and we're going to full circle back to the, some more U.S. data because what I want you to see is what's happening in China is indeed coming to America in a matter of months. Let's go to Bloomberg where he picked today's story up with a headline, U.S. Retail Sales Top Forecast showcasing consumer resilience as July sales rose a whopping 0.7% after upward revisions to prior months. Now, this is going to get everybody excited from the Fed to economists to experts saying, look at the resilience of the U.S. consumer. Despite the fact that everyone thinks we're in a recession or heading into one, they're outspending. And that proves that we are no way, it's not even possible that the economy could slow down. Well, we're going to put some cold water on this because there's one notable thing that happens during recessions, and that's consumers still spend. Let's continue on. The latest data illustrates how American households, supported by a strong labor market and rising wages, we're going to put that to task too, are so far buttressing the economy against recession in the face of high interest rates. Too much strength, however, could force the Federal Reserve to pursue more aggressive policy should inflationary pressures prove sticky. And that's kind of the belief here is that, wow, retail sales, they, they went up, and that means there's a lot of demand, and that means inflation's coming back. But history and the data, well, they don't quite suggest that, but that doesn't mean the narrative won't be being pushed really hard. And here we can see when we look at advanced retail sales, you'll notice we can go back to the dot-com bubble and we can only see what would be two brief one-month contractions. And nevertheless, you can see there was steady retail sales because people still spend money during a recession. And what happened during the dot-com bubble? Well, it slowed, but people still spent until it crashed. Now, why did retail sales crash there? Because it's kind of notable when banks start to fail, when you have a banking crisis, not only do people stop spending, they stop accessing the credit markets, and then you see retail sales outright plummet. So the fact that right now that we're seeing a little tick up higher in retail sales is almost meaningless because it's all about the rate of change. This thing dramatically slowed down, and we're going to show you here in a little bit of why this data is actually worse than it appears. Sales which aren't adjusted for inflation, there's a key problem, but we're going to fix that, increased in nine of the 13 retail categories last month. Sales at non-store retailers, which includes e-commerce, jumped 1.9%, the most this year, and boosted by Amazon's Prime Day event. The company said the first day of the two-day July event was its single largest sales day ever, and so, of course, we know that's going to backfeed into the retail sales data. But now let's take a look at this when we adjust for inflation, because the question is, is really the spending of consumers robust? Are they shrugging off inflation and taking advantage of these higher wages? Or is really the issue that the reason retail sales look good is because prices have gone up? And here we can see in the data when we take consumer price index and we adjust it off of the retail sales data, that indeed the reason retail sales are looking good, at least on the headline number, is because prices are higher. And here you can go back to the dot-com bubble and see that inflation-adjusted retail sales or real retail sales indeed contracted. We can see that again right at the onset of the global financial crisis. And look at what's happening now. Indeed, we're seeing a contraction there. And so what that means is retailers are still doing in terms of dollar amount, they're doing more business, but in terms of quantity, they're just not doing as much, and that's not a good sign at all. But what about this robustness of spending but that we hear is because of wages being higher? Well, let's take a look at total compensation against retail sales, and it paints a whole different picture than what the media is doing. 
And here we have total compensation, which is average weekly hours multiplied by average hourly earnings of production and non-supervisory employees, that in red against advanced retail sales. And what a shocking revelation this is, as of course we see wage total compensation slow, what naturally happens to retail sales? Well, it slows too. You can see that going into, of course, the global financial crisis. You can see that now the total compensation is slowing, and now, of course, makes sense that of course retail sales real inflation adjusted retail sales is indeed slowing so as long as compensation continues to slow down what we're going to see is the same effect in retail sales so the notable side here that we're hearing that consumer is strong well not so much because not too long ago we got some data on the credit card from the fed that said that there was actually a contraction that consumers were starting to pay down their debt well that's going to have a negative impact probably in the months to come that we'll soon see. And something else that highlights perhaps that the government data is a little off is a Johnson Red Book Index for same store sales. This is weekly data shown on a year over year rate of change. Well, it's not doing too hot at all. It's not contracting, but it's 0.3%. It's just a smidge above it, suggesting that perhaps the government may be cooking the books a little bit. But let's turn to China now, because here's what's really the surprising move is China cuts their rate. This would be their equivalent to the federal funds rate by the most since 2020 as economic woes deepen. Now, here's what's important to understand about you know, when you see these central banks cutting rates, because they like to react to the data. And you hear this from the Fed all the time. We're data dependent. So literally, the economy can go in, going off of a cliff. But until the data, which was, we know is lagged by as much depending on the data series one to three months sometimes a little bit more the fed is just literally going to stand there with our eyes closed not knowing what to do but it's when the central bank starts to cut rates it tells us there's some serious problem but of course in our case we can see the data that the fed's reacting to in china they're starting to cut rates even though the data is not quite that bad yet and what that tells us from a central bank perspective What's going on in China is far worse than even we thought. The People's Bank of China lowered the rate on its one-year loans or medium-term lending facility by 15 basis points to 2.5% on Tuesday, the second reduction in June. So this isn't a one-off number. Remember, way back in June, we said there would be more cuts. Here they are. All but one of these 15 analysts surveyed by Bloomberg predicted the rate would stay unchanged. And the surprise move came shortly before the release of disappointing economic activity data for July, showing growth in consumer spending, industrial output, and investment sliding across the board, and unemployment picking up. And so you start to look at the U.S. data, and what are we seeing? We're seeing slowdowns in all of those same areas, suggesting that at some point, the Fed's going to react and cut. In this case, what we see from the People's Bank of China, they came out ahead of the data, almost admitting defeat. And what that tells us, as since this is their second Second cut now the things there are far worse than we thought because it means rate cuts don't have an immediate impact in fact they don't even have a huge impact on the economy but the fact that the central bank is doing it tells us things there are indeed grim the PBOC's move was the first under the new governor of Pan Gongsheng, a former deputy at the PBOC who was promoted last month following the surprise retirement of Ying Gang. There's been a slew of bad economic news since Pan has taken office, with data last week showing bank loans plunging to a 14-year low in July, deflation setting in, and exports contracting further. And of course, we know from central banker history and all the books they've written and everything they say about it, they love to deal with deflation. In fact, it actually scares them because what they do know is if there is deflation, you just keep cutting rates. And magically, someday, at some point, it goes away. But one of the key things that we just saw here is this contraction. Let's look at it in bank loans. That actually matters in a big way. Let's pull up some U.S. data because I want to make the case why the Fed should be cutting now. And at some point, they're going to be cutting in a big way and most likely back to zero, trying to figure out how to go negative. 
And here you can see commercial industrial loans is shown in blue on a year over year rate of change as we noted in yesterday's show. This thing is sitting at around 1.7% year over year and rapidly heading to zero because it's shown on the left side here. And we got the federal funds rate in red overlaid. And what I want you to see is as there's a slowdown in lending, what happens? The Fed starts cutting rates to try to sustain lending growth. But usually by that point, it's too late. Here you can see it again going into the dot com bubble. Bank lending slows down. The Fed starts to cut. You see it going into the global financial crisis. It slowed a little bit, popped up, and then came crumbling down, which is what I think is going to happen again. Of course, the Fed following suit, cutting, cutting, cutting. This happened again going into the pandemic. This was before the pandemic started, as many thought we were heading into a global recession. And look now, you can see almost one of the first times, if not the first time in our data, that we see the slowdown in commercial industrial lending. The PBOC is doing the right move for their country. But look at the Fed. They're talking about rates going higher when really rates should be going lower because at some point when this starts to contract, we're going to see, as we made in the case of the show yesterday, outright deflation. And that's when the Fed will be chasing rates all the way down to zero. As China's economic woes are rippling through the rest of the world and worrying global policymakers, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said China's slowdown was a risk factor for the American economy, although the impact would be greater for Asian neighbors. Not at all, Ms. Yellen. In fact, the risk factor here is that China exports a deflation. So if their economy is shrinking and contracting, it means price pressures are falling, which means we're going to see further import prices into the U.S., particularly out of China, going down and down even more. That's going to per, per start to confirm conflict and compete with high cost U.S. manufacturers, which we're going to get to in a little bit here, who have now given everyone raises and can't deal with it. And that's why when we see China exporting deflation, what eventually comes is more Americans on the unemployment line. And here you can see the challenge here, the consumer price index shown in blue against the import price index, this from China, both on a year-over-year -year rate of change. And you can notably see where import prices in China go. Well, U.S. consumer prices follow. Just think about then this. When's the last time you bought something made in China? Well, you probably did just recently. And that's why these two matter, suggesting that even though there's this little hook in CPI that everyone got excited about last week, it still suggests the consumer price is indeed headed much lower. And then adding to the narrative that things are wrong in China and getting worse in a big way is China halts the youth jobs data stoking transparency concerns. Now, this is actually a bigger issue here because if you're wondering, why would they just kind of hide the data? Why would they just cover it up? Is it because you know they can't get the data? There's just too many people on employment. They ran out of people to count. No, the issue starts to become when people get disenfranchised about the economy in some way or another. For example, if people believe a recession's coming, they'll just stop spending. If they think they can't get a job, they won't go looking for one. And so all of a sudden, when you have too much negative data, well, you've got a huge problem. Well, one answer is just make it go away. The National Bureau of Statistics didn't release a figure for the jobless rate for people aged between 16 and 24 in its July economic activity report on Tuesday. Youth unemployment hit a record of 21.3% in June, with the Bureau last month indicating the figure would probably increase. And of course, we can note if the global economy is indeed slowing down, which is what the data suggests, and export out of China are going down, well, guess what they probably need a lot less of? And that's labor. And so you can imagine being in this 16 to 24 year old age range there in China, and you're thinking about maybe perhaps bringing some money in, and you look at the data and says, look, Everybody you know is practically unemployed and they have no chance in a job. The chances that you're going to then go out and look for a job are pretty low. You might as well just stay at home because what it's telling us is as more and more of that age group are unemployed, then what people do is they give up. And that's not a good thing, but you can control the narrative by just making the data go away and hoping people soon forget about it and start looking for work.
Here we can see a spokesman for the MBS said the labor statistics need, well, of course, further optimization. Why wouldn't they? And more research needs to be done on whether students looking for a job before graduation should be counted in the labor statistics because that would be the other way to fix a report is maybe not just take it away, but retool it, change the whole thing around and bring the number down so that way people believe that perhaps the Chinese economy is better than it appears, that they'll go out and look for work, get jobs, spend money, and cause the economy to rebound. But we know that's not how their economy works. They're such focused and such an issue with exports there until the global economy turns around, China is unlikely to. And the move is the latest example of how President Xi Jinping's government is limiting access to information in order to closely guard, here you go, the data it deems sensitive to manage the narrative about the weakening economy. That is all, my friends, an internal issue they don't want people to know. But now as we're going to turn back to the U.S., because remember, when China exports deflation, as it does, with a lag, have an impact on U.S. manufacturers. Today, we got the Empire State Manufacturing Survey, and check this out. Business activity declined in New York State, according to firms responding to the recent survey. The headline General Business Condition Index, this is huge, fell 20 points to minus 19. But look further. New orders and shipments fell significantly, demand going down. Delivery times were steady, and inventories moved lower. Labor market indicators pointed to steady employment, because we know that no one wants to laugh yet, but a shorter average work week, that's lower total compensation, is in play. Input and selling prices increases picked up, as well as capital spending plans firmed a little bit. Outlook, though, remains positive, of course, because you know what else are they going to do? They hired these people, they don't have enough work for them, and they don't want to get rid of them, so they gotta be optimistic. But what does this mean for retail sales? When we take a look at current general business conditions, the diffusion index for New York against advanced retail sales, that's shown in red. What we can see is where, of course, business conditions in New York go. Retail sales on a year-over-year -year rate change, well, they're going to follow down. Here we see the global financial crisis. Here we can see I highlighted this because this was that, you know, 2015, 2016, where the world almost went into recession, but China pulled us out. Here you can see, of course, the New York manufacturing uh, data showing a slowdown here and retail sales falling. And this is just validating that at some point we're going to see increased layoffs in the manufacturing sector, and that will indeed lead to lower retail sales. But somebody who is really hitting the sales out of the park, well, that's our sponsor, Saluna, which I said before was one of the most interesting business models I've ever seen. And they're out to sell every megawatt that sell all that renewable energy with your power plant generates. You can find them on the NASDAQ under the symbol SLNH. We've got all the information in the description, the pin comment for you. Check it out. Let's take a look at what this company is doing and why I think their stock could go up as much as 52%. What they do is buy curtailed or what's called excess energy from the renewable power plants and convert it to clean, low-cost global computing. So there are times during the day when this green energy is being generated and there's excess, no one needs it. And what Saluna does is come in and says, you know what, we've got a plan for this, which is absolutely super cool. And what they do is they put up these data centers and they mine Bitcoin and they sell the Bitcoin they, and they do some other things as part of their long-term strategy here. But initially what they do is they mine Bitcoin themselves and then they sell it to generate money to pay for their data centers, which are parked, as you can see, right next to the renewable power. And so what these are is purpose built to efficiently convert curtailed renewable energy into high performance computing. And it's not just Bitcoin. They're going to change this whole space as you're about to see. As far as their stock looks, something that we think is going to make a big change, as you can know, looking back at history, their stock's gone from roughly where it is today, around 25 cents a share, all the way up to almost 19 at one point, is now back down here. What's real critical is you can see the volume profile here is telling us that support is right at where it's trading today. This is a long-term channel, and we zoom in, you're going to see a move here that we think can go up off those moving averages where it's holding support and put up a nice potential. 52% gain. We know this momentum is still turning positive here. Let's take a look a little bit more at what they're doing. 
because really the secret, the special thing about this company is their Maestro OS. It is really cool. It's what they call their force multiplier. And what this does is it enhances the equipment lifespan and reduces failures through multiple redundancies but with complete automation of fans, the miners, PDUs, power infrastructure, and the network. This thing is amazing. It handles all the real-time tracking of their miners. It's got comprehensive diagnostic and alerting system, and this thing can make quick adjustments when it needs to. It can accept multiple grid and power stimuli to feed the algorithm and achieves 99% curtailment, get this, in less than 60 seconds, and can achieve full power restoration within a whopping eight minutes, if you can imagine that. And here's what we can see in the short term. Today, at the time of filming, the stock was trading at around 25 cents a share. We're gonna show you their latest press release, which the market didn't like at first, but I tell you, it's big news, because what's gonna happen here is if you see this holding support underneath that green line, that's the 50-day moving average, and the blue line, that's the 100-day, the red one's the 21, but if you see it holding support here, look at the volume profile, a little red line at 25 cents a share, a pop up to that 200 day moving average, well, that could be a potential 50% move. Now, how's this company making money? Well, they do their own in-house Bitcoin mining currently, and they also do hosting for other Bitcoin miners. What's really powerful about what Saluna does is because they're using excess energy, their cost to actually mine is lower than a lot of their competitors, which gives them a huge advantage. But their future isn't just with Bitcoin. As they scale, they're gonna turn this model over to high performance computing, people who are looking to get Get their data crunched but not pay the big power bills for immediate service and here's what their program is they source low cost curtailed power from IPPs, they build their own and operate their multi, those MDCs, those data centers with a two-year return on capital. If that's amazing, they attract customers, which is what their model is moving into now, and mine Bitcoin. They provide ancillary services to the grid. Their plan is then to grow their AUM and embed it over fixed costs, grow their pipeline, rinse and repeat. It's a really neat model that tells me their stock could be the next big move here as it continues to consolidate you see today's move down right into support at 25 cents a share and we can see momentum is still trending sideways outside of today's move and the macd is, is moving up off of oversold conditions if it holds support here the stock could go up quite a bit and what their plan for this year is to energize Dorothy, their shift, their flagship site from construction to operations, improve their cash flow, expand their flagship operations, and grow their pipeline. And one thing we think will grow as the CEO, John, does his work, which I had a wonderful conversation with, we think the stock price could go up a whole lot. Here we zoom in, looking at the 30-day chart, you can see clearly holding support here, momentum still looking like is about just to hit oversold conditions a move up from there could be impressive and they just announced today again under the nasdaq symbol s l n h that they just had the cash balance as of june 30th was seven and a half million compared to 1.1 million as of december 31st 2022 driven by new project level investments operational execution and expense management measures implemented in the first half of the year. And that's one of the things we love about Saluna. Again, they are making money. They're working on improving that and expanding their operations, which we think is absolutely fantastic. Again, you can check them out on the NASDAQ under the symbol SLNH. And again, all the links to the research, their website in the description below. And as always, with any of the sponsors we feature on this channel, Please do your own research before making any trade. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.